uh, you have inside of your bulletins, our core values at New Hope Christian Church. And so as we continue in this sermon series, uh, we're, we're land here on number four, and I'd like you to follow along as I read. <clears throat> because we believe that God loves all people with no exceptions, we value pursuing a diverse audience and rescuing them from the painful effects of sin. We choose, whenever possible, to care for those in need to remove any unnecessary barriers to presenting unbelievers with the gospel of salvation. Now, closely tied with that core value is also one of our core beliefs, which is found on the website. So I'm going to go ahead and read that as well. We believe that humanity was created in loving relationship with God as the ultimate crown of His creation. Made in the image of God, every human being is valuable. Even when we are separated from God by our sin, God loves all people. <clears throat> Karl Barth was one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century. He was extremely opposed to Nazis, uh, the Nazis' attempt to create a, a German Christian church. When Barth refused to take the oath of allegiance to Adolf Hitler, he was told to leave Germany in 1935. As a college professor in his homeland of Switzerland, Karl Barth spoke out publicly about the Nazis' inhumane treatment of the Jews. He frequently shed light on the plight of other oppressed people, as well as regularly visited prisoners who were in jail. He made one trip to America, and in that, during that one trip in 1962, Barth lectured at several institutions of higher learning. When asked at the University of Chicago Divinity School what Barth considered to be the greatest theological discovery of his life, Karl Barth paused for a moment, and with a smile he replied, the greatest theological insight I've ever had is this. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. What do you think is probably the most well-known verse in the entire Bible? Well, if you were thinking John 3.16, you're right. Uh, it's been called the gospel in a nutshell. Because many of the most important doctrines found in the Bible are summarized in this one verse of Scripture. And consequently, John 3.16 regularly appears at sporting events and in many other unusual places as well. Because John 3.16 clearly articulates the love that God has for every human being and identifies Jesus Christ as the hope for all mankind. At New Hope Christian Church, we believe that God's passion and God's love for all people should be reflected in the lives of his followers as we have a passion and a love for all people as well. So if you turn your bulletin over on the back side, uh, we're going to fill in the blanks here. Uh, and I want to start by, first of all, looking at God's example. I like to occasionally watch the National Geographic Channel. And uh, every time I do, I'm just amazed at how everything in creation, big and small, down to the smallest of insect, one leaf from a tree, one blade of grass, everything in creation has a role and a purpose in this circle of life. And as I, as I watch this programming, I'm in awe at how Every plant, every animal has unique characteristics that allow it to exist, to thrive, to reproduce. And as I watch, I'm just as amazed that rational people created with a godlike capacity to reason can still believe that all of this wonder and all of this awe and its intricate details somehow just evolved into existence. As someone has said, and I quote, it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to believe in God. 
The Bible tells us that after God created every plant and every animal, there was one more thing he needed to create, people. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and rule over it, subdue it. And to show the priority that people have in God's creation, he commanded that every animal responsible for taking the life of a human being would would have to be killed. Furthermore, he said, if any human being takes another person's life, that person's life must be taken by human hands. Why? Because God made us in his image. The psalmist says that God made human beings a little lower than himself, and he crowns us with glory and with honor, and he looks at us and he says, you are my creation. You ever ask the question, well, if that's the case, if we were made in God's image, why don't we all look alike? Well, uh, God is not flesh and bones. God is a spirit, the Bible tells us. He doesn't consist of flesh and bones, and therefore we are made in God's spiritual image. As such, only human beings have the the capacity to reason. Only human beings have the free will to choose God, and God desires people who willingly want to follow Him. God wants people who freely choose to obey Him. But when God created us with that capacity, He did so with a risk. The risk is we might choose not to follow Him. We might choose not to obey Him. And since we're born with a rebellious nature, it's just a matter of time before we all sin. The Bible's clear about that. And I want to make it clear. The doctrine of sin is not a matter of you and I making an occasional mistake here and there. Any more than... It's not like a musician occasionally making mistakes while he or she is is playing a musical instrument. Sin is more like a, a musician trying to make a pleasant sound from an instrument that's missing some keys. We're more than sometimes sinful. We're broken. We were born with a rebellious heart. And that's what makes God's love for us so amazing. God sent his son to die for us while technically we were still at odds with him. We were still enemies of his. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God showed his great love for us by sending his son Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Why? Why did he do that? Because of a love that we can't fathom. Because his love is unconditional. Peter Miller was a Baptist pastor, personal friend of General George Washington. Uh, Reverend Miller lived in uh, Pennsylvania during the Revolutionary War. One of his fiercest critics, most outspoken enemies, was a guy named Michael Whitman. Michael Whitman was also a traitor to his country. It was later discovered, arrested, sentenced to die. Reverend Peter Miller walked 70 miles one way to Philadelphia to plead for the life of Michael Whitman. It was Peter Miller's friend, General George Washington, who had sentenced Michael Whitman to die. And George Washington told Reverend Miller no amount of pleading from him was going to spare or save his friend Whitman's life. Friend? The preacher said, friend, he's the worst enemy I have. Washington said, wait a minute. You walked 70 miles one way to plead for the life of an enemy? Changes everything. Washington said, I will grant Mr. Whitman a pardon. And you better believe that when 
Peter Miller, took Michael Whitman, and they went back to Pennsylvania. They did so as friends, no longer enemies. God doesn't love you and I because we go to church. God doesn't love you and I because we read the Bible. God doesn't love you and I because we've been baptized. God loves you and me simply because he created us. In spite of the fact that our sin puts us at odds with him, he loves us unconditionally. Farmers know that if you want to keep your cattle and your your livestock, your pigs, your other animals, horses, if you want to keep them from wandering, you got to build a fence around them and regularly maintain that fence. But in Australia, fences are kind of useless. I mean, the ranches are so huge, so big, that fences are neither affordable for ranches that big or practical. So in the outback of Australia, where it is very, very hot and dry, a farmer who has a well has a precious supply of water. And while a farmer's livestock may stray a little ways away from time to time, the farmer doesn't worry about it because he knows those livestock are going to stay close to the source of water. Likewise, there was a time when God showed the Israelites their need for a Savior by giving them a fence. It was called the Law of Moses. But they broke through that fence time after time over the the years. And they strayed far from God as they did that. So that it wasn't until centuries later, when God knew the conditions were just right, when he knew the people were finally going to listen, that God sent the Israelites a savior. And just as a reliable source of water keeps a farmer's animals from straying too far in Australia without the use of a fence, so God uses love and not law to keep his sheep from straying today. And about the time that you and I start to stray away, it is God's love for us that corrals us back in, that brings us back to him. And Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3 is that somehow, you and I would understand how wide and how long and how deep and how high God's love is for us. How wide is God's love for us? Well, John 16 says, God so loved the world. That's how wide it is. It's wide enough to include everyone, regardless of whether we love God back or not. How long is God's love for us? John 3.16 says he gave his only son. Would you be willing to give up one of your children who's totally healthy, give up their heart for the sake of another human being? That's what God did. That's how long his love is for us. How deep is God's love for us? John 3.16 tells us, It's deep enough to cover everyone who believes, regardless of how far we've wandered, regardless of how much we've messed up our lives. It's that deep. How high is God's love? It's high enough to last through all of eternity. God so loved you and me so much, he sent his son so that you and I could spend eternity with him. That's God's example. So what is our response? Scripture is very clear that if we are to live like Jesus, if we are to follow the example of Jesus, then we got to intentionally choose to love like Jesus. We need to love like God. Now how can we know if our love for God is sincere. How can we know if our love for God is genuine? Jesus warns us in Matthew chapter 7 and and verse 21, he says, you know, a lot of people are going to be stunned on the day of judgment when they realize they're not headed to heaven because they said they loved me with their lips, with their words, but their actions didn't show it. 
the Apostle John wrote in his first letter to help people know they have eternal life. John wanted us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when we die, we're going to be with the Lord. And so John writes, dear friends, let's love one another. For love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. John was not saying that what God is is love. John was saying who God is is love. And John is saying that if an unselfish, sacrificial giving of ourselves to others isn't at the core of who we are, if that's not who we are, then God isn't living inside of us. Since we are born with a selfish nature, loving like God loves requires being born again. That's what Jesus said. To care for other people the way that God cares for other people requires dying to our old nature and receiving a new nature from God. Jesus says, as I have loved you, you've got to love one another. In fact, he said, if you really love me, you need to obey my command to love each other. Paul said we should imitate God in everything we do because you are God's children. Live a life filled with love and thereby follow the example of Jesus Christ. If we truly belong to Christ, then Christ's love is going to control the way that we love others because he loves me and I don't deserve it, then I need to love others who don't deserve it. Does that make sense? Christ's love for us compels us. It controls us to supernaturally do things and love people that we otherwise couldn't, wouldn't group of teens were having fun one night when they, some suggested going to a bar and playing some games there, and Jan told her date, I'd rather just go home. My parents don't approve of that place. One of the girls in the group overheard her sarcastically, uh, said to Jan, are you afraid your dad's going to be angry? Are you afraid your dad will hurt you? Jan said, no, I'm afraid that if I go, I might hurt my dad. Jan knew that when we've experienced the love of God through other people, the last thing we want to do is sin against God. By sinning against that and and hurting that person who showed us his love. When Alan Keyes ran for president in the year 2000, he was accused of being a one-issue candidate because he included this same message at every campaign stop he made. And I heard him speak on several occasions, and he said this, and I quote it, we cannot have a moral and civil government of the people, for the people, and by the people, unless the people have a fundamental view that every human being has the right to life. And I would suggest to you that accounts for why we're in the mess that we are. Because not everybody shares that thought. Kurt Bruner wrote in the Focus on the Family newsletter, and I quote, Human worth comes from divine decree, not human opinion. Life is from our maker and for our maker. Case closed. Loving like God means we don't get to pick and choose who we're going to love. Loving like Jesus means there's going to be people we don't like. But we have to love them anyway. Now, we don't have to agree with them, but we have to love them. Loving like Jesus means that when we don't want to be bothered by other people's problems, we listen anyway. Loving like Jesus means that when people criticize us, or when they hurt us, or when they hurt our family, we love them anyway. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, and I quote, I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. 
And the 13th century Italian priest, St. Francis of Assisi, once prayed, Lord, grant that I might not, not so much seek to be loved by others, but to love others. So we need to love like God, but more than that, we need to prove our love. As John the Immerser was preparing the way for the Messiah, many were professing their need to get serious with the Lord. But when some religious leaders were wanting to be baptized, John, the Baptist who didn't mince words, said, you hypocrites, who warned you to turn from your wicked ways? You leave here and first demonstrate your repentance by the way you live and by the way you treat others, and then you can come back and we'll talk about baptism. James writes, don't just listen to God's word, you must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. John adds, Jesus demonstrated for us what real love is when he gave up his life for us. If one of you has enough money to live well and sees someone in need but shows no compassion toward that person, how can God's love be in you? Let's not love each other with just our words but with our actions. I did not realize there are some cities in America today that hand out thousands of free one-way ticket, one-way bus tickets to the homeless every year. It's called the Homeless Relocation Program. Basically, if I can just be blunt, the purpose of the program is to ship the problem of the homeless somewhere else. That's basically what it is. Now, before we're too critical of cities for doing that, we probably need to ask ourselves how often God has brought someone into our lives and we did only what was needed in the moment to be able to ship them on their way to somewhere else, someone else. If our faith is going to grow, we have to resist the temptation to ship the needy somewhere else. James says, suppose someone comes to you without food or clothes. If you say, here's a bus ticket, that's kind of a, James didn't say that, I added that. Here's a bus ticket, go in peace, stay warm, but do nothing else. What good is that? Faith without action means nothing. In his book entitled Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis wrote, and I quote, don't waste your time wondering if you love your neighbor. <clears throat> act as if you do. When you behave, or when we behave as if we love someone, we find ourselves coming to genuinely loving them. True story, a wife was seeking counsel from a famous psychologist named Dr. George W. Crane, and uh, she found out this principle firsthand she came to the doctor, she said, uh, I hate my husband, I hate him so much, I want a divorce from him. Fact is, I want to hurt him as much as I can. Dr. Crane told her, and by the way, he was a, a syndicated columnist for a newspapers for several years as well, he said, if that's the case, he said, I would advise you to start by showering him with compliments. At the moment when he thinks you really love him, lower the boom and file for divorce, that will really hurt him. So when she returned a few months later and told the good doctor she had done exactly what he had told her to do, he said, great, now's the time to, to file for divorce. He'll be devastated. And, and the woman replied somewhat indignantly, divorce, no way. I love him too much to do that. You see, sometimes... When we choose to do things we don't necessarily feel like doing, it changes the way we feel. Something happens inside of us when we choose to show love to people, even if we don't really want to. Pope St. Gregory the Great once said, and I quote, the proof of love is in our actions. Where true love truly exists, it does wonderful things. But when love ceases to act, it ceases to exist.
I don't know what you went through this week. And the fact of the matter is, very few of us know what everybody was going through this past week. When we came through the door, there were people who came in who, whose marriages probably are kind of just hanging on by the thread. And there are people who came in here this morning and they're sitting amongst us who came in here hurting. Just trying to find hope to go another day. And I'm saying to you this morning that if we claim to follow Jesus, I think we got one of two choices. We can either come to church and worship with other believers with some issues in our lives that we, we need to seek out somebody to minister to us, or we can leave our issues at home temporarily and we come to church to worship with other people looking for those that we can minister to. That's it. Our prayer before we ever leave home or on our way to worship with other believers should be something like, Lord, open up my eyes, open up my ears to those I need to meet or talk to or, or listen to or smile at or hug or show the love of Jesus. In fact, that should be our attitude, our prayer every morning, every day. Lord, give me the spiritual antenna today to see who I can love in your name. And imagine what would happen if, if all of us and our brothers and sisters from other congregations were all fanning out every day, every week doing that. What an impact we'd have on, on those around us. Lee Strobel uh, is a lawyer, a, a journalist. That's quite a combination. And he was the legal affairs editor of the prestigious Chicago Tribune newspaper, the largest newspaper uh, between the East Coast and the West Coast. He was also an atheist. He was hostile to Christianity because he thought it was based on myths and anybody that would believe that kind of stuff is kind of a weak-minded individual. Well, shortly after he and his wife welcomed their first child into the world, complications set in uh, with the baby while uh, um, they were still in the hospital. And a group of uh, doctors entered uh, his wife's room, a group of them, with the news, your daughter is very, very serious condition. We don't know what's wrong with her. She may not make it. We've already taken her to the neonatal intensive care unit. Put yourself in that position. How would you deal with that? In his own words, Leo Strobel said, um, what do you do when you're an atheist? And you hear that kind of news. And while he was in the hallway, and in those days the phone was on the wall, and a nurse answered uh, the phone, and she said, is there a Lee Strobel here? And he said, yeah, I'm Lee Strobel. He gets on the line, and, and there's a guy named David, a Christian man, who says, Lee, Lee, I just heard about your daughter. What can I do? I've asked my congregation to, to pray for your daughter. I'll be right down. I'm coming down to the hospital. I'll run errands for you. I'll just sit there. I'll do whatever you need me to do. And as Lee Strobel was sharing this in a talk at, at the Valley Church in West Des Moines on Friday night, he said, I didn't deserve that kind of kindness. I had publicly ripped this guy apart. I had publicly ridiculed David. And here he is showing me a compassion I had never experienced before. And according to Strobel, it was that compassion that helped lead him to find Jesus Christ. Twelve days later, after the doctor said, we don't know what's wrong with her, but she could die, they came into the room and said, we don't know what's happened, but you can take her home today. <laughs> Listen to me very carefully because I'm guilty. 
Love will always find a way to do good. Indifference will usually find an excuse to do nothing. In Acts chapter 10, the Apostle Peter is given this great opportunity to speak to a Roman military general named Cornelius and his family and his entire household, all of his servants. And in the midst of that sermon in Acts chapter 10, Peter says, uh, you've heard about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with holy power, with Holy Spirit power. You've heard about all the good deeds and the healing that Jesus was doing. I mean, he, even without our modern technology, everybody was hearing about this Jesus and the good deeds that he had been doing. Listen to me. We were created by God for the same good purpose. We were given the same Holy Spirit power to be an instrument of good deeds and healing just like Jesus was 2,000 years ago. And because we believe that God loves all people without exceptions, we need to love all people without exceptions. We may not agree with them, but we need to love them. And I pray that this week, God would use all of us to show his love to those whom he reveals to us need that love. Let's pray. Lord, I think I speak on behalf of everyone here when I say thank you. Thank you for leading people into my life, both before I came to you and since I've come to you, who have demonstrated your divine, unselfish, sacrificial love in ways I, 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 can't, I, I, I can't fully fathom. And I thank you, God, for a patience. I don't know how many times, God, we say, oh, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I'll never do that again. And you do. And we do it again. And I pray, Father, that you would give to us that same Holy Spirit divine will to intentionally live out your love with whomever you bring us in contact with. May you, God, be blessed. May you receive the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.